My name's Dan Deacon, and we're in my home in my studio. I'd like to tell you about my new album, Mystic Familiar, and the process of writing it. A mystic familiar is an entity that can communicate magically with another person. Merlin's owl, a witch's cat. I got really into the idea of having this communicative ability with a, another entity, thinking about different emotional states like that. Doubt as a familiar who's trying to throw you off your path. Musically, I wanted to represent that as different treatments of the voice. Anything that's voiced as I will actually be me, and then everything else could be a familiar. This record is definitely the most I've ever used my natural voice. I feel very self-conscious and vulnerable about my singing, so I, I often like heavily code it in pitch shifting or effects and vocoder. For this one, I really wanted it to be as it is, imperfect. I felt very raw recording and I felt very vulnerable using my voice that way and I wanted to harness that vulnerability and make it an aspect of the music. There's a couple of beautiful trees that I have the privilege of seeing when I look out the window. I like thinking about trees as like a, a jester kind of figure. Two tracks on this record are focused on trees. One is Weeping Birch and the other is Sat by a Tree. Something I did, I sat by a tree and I was trying to meditate. And at first it was like, how dare you? I thought it was gonna give me guidance, but really it asked me a series of challenging questions. And that's what the lyrics are, this unfolding of these questions. After the When I Was Done Dying video came out, people seemed to really resonate with the lyrics. I had never gotten comments on lyrics like that before, where people were like talking about how they processed loss and how it helped them think about it, and that made me think about it. That's why the voice and lyrics were so important for me on this record, and also so trying, because it was the first time I was really going in head first. Since Gliss Riffer scored eight films, changed the way I thought about writing music. With a film, there's other voices entering the room. So when I went back to writing my own project, it was very daunting to not have that collaborative aspect. That's where like elements of doubt and anxiety came into the mix. I got into meditation basically kicking and screaming, being very frustrated, thinking I was doing it wrong. And then I read David Lynch's Catching the Big Fish. It really resonated with me. Everything I had been trying started to fall into place. The big fish in Lynch's book are these large ideas, ideas that you can't get to unless you're focused. That book so simply and eloquently lays out both the need and the way to go deeper into oneself, to pull out things that you wouldn't otherwise find. Uh, one thing that entered the process were Brian Eno's oblique strategy cards. Oblique Strategy is a deck of cards where each one has a prompt on it to help someone in a studio environment get through a hurdle. I used this deck very, very heavily in making the record. I would draw a card at the start of every day, and it was just a way of adding intention. Having the deck to refer to sometimes brought me to places I wouldn't have gone otherwise. I'm not alone in feeling stress and anxiety and doubt, but it's important to remember that like any feeling, those feelings pass. I hope when people listen to this record, they get a sense of relief in the same sense that I got in making it. Making this record was a logistical impracticality. I recorded the record whenever I could, wherever I was. If I was on tour, I would try to collaborate with people there. I wrote a lot in my apartment. I was in Austin, Texas, and I recorded at the synthesizer shop, switched on. I recorded with Dustin Wong in a motel room at three in the morning. His playing is very, very human and conversation-like. I think we did 13 takes, where each time I would try to give a different note or direction. The guitar part that you hear on Bumblebee Crown King is me editing and chopping those 13 takes to one session. It was a really crazy way to record, and I was trying to collaborate with people as much as possible, so bringing in players and improvisers I really love, players that I think have that same sort of mindset of trusting their instincts. Andrew Bernstein is one of those players to me. With the structured improvisation, 
what we would do is Andrew would go into the sound booth and I would be in my kitchen, which was the control room at the time. I would try to put him in a mindset, bring a player to mind like, all right, so think about this as uh, similar in the playing of Pharaoh Sanders, but you're very forlorn, you're confused. The same way that like a director would try to give an actor a prompt and see where they go with the scene. Strings are something that I explored a lot heavier on this record than I have on other ones. Strings to me are very mysterious, and they're very, very human. The person's playing pours out of the instrument. I love the idea of a non-human controlled acoustic sound. So it was a long time coming to find good robotic drums. The point was never to replace human drummers. The point was to create a different kind of drumming. The drum robots, they had a lot of personality and it took a long time to find the right way to record them and mount them and to get them to really sing as best they could. There's nothing more rewarding than playing music with other people. Learn how to find a new voice in a new direction through experimentation and through what you learn from those failures. It's only an experiment if you do not know the outcome. And I try to put that into my work as much as possible.